Well, maybe let's go ahead and get started. There's, there's what? Oh, there she is. So how how are you guys doing? Did you guys did you guys look at the capstone this week at all? Anybody look at it? Raise your hand if you looked at it at all. It's a little bit complicated. What? And um, hopefully, well, you guys can ask me if you have too much trouble. It, it's got a lot of um, sort of mathy stuff in it, which you don't have to understand to do it. There was a capstone on gravitational wave analysis, gravitational wave data analysis. Yeah. No, you just click on it and it opens it, and then it shows you the. F okay. Well, we can we'll, we can find it in the in the. Um, section in the lab section. Okay, so this is going to be a introduction to LIGO. So we're not going to do, this is going to be the special science lecture. Um, this is pretty exciting to me because this is all the stuff that I work on and I think it's all really cool and I think you guys will think it's cool too. Um, so anyway, let me, I'll just go ahead and get right started. Okay. Albert Einstein. I assume everybody knows who Albert Einstein is. Almost certainly the most famous scientist that humans have ever produced. Uh, he was a very cool guy, and he did... There's, it's, not, it's not a fluke that he's considered the smartest guy, because he did a lot of different stuff in physics. That's kind of the most interesting thing about Albert Einstein is that he, he touched all different parts of physics, which was really interesting and unusual. I mean, not very many people have ever had this sort of broad and deep influence that he had. I mean, nobody has, period, basically. Um, okay, so his kind of crowning achievement was the general theory of relativity. And so the general theory of relativity was a new theory of gravity. So the previous theory of gravity came from Newton back, you know, hundreds of years ago. And that Newton's theory was, you know, very simple and straightforward and it was one of the, the first most beautiful physics theories. It was, you know, the, one of the earliest times that, you know, somebody came up with a whole framework, a mathematical framework for describing how things in the universe work. But it wasn't quite, there were some problems with it that are very subtle. I won't get into all of the details, but um, eventually it was realized that we had, to, we had to tweak this theory for various reasons, and that's where Einstein came in. And there was a lot of people who worked up to all of this stuff before Einstein. But Einstein, this is, this is a complicated thing, equation, but this is the basically, this is the primary equation of Einstein's general theory of relativity. And what it does is it, these, these, these objects here, these big letters with these lowercase Greek letters, these are called tensors. They're a special mathematical object that you'll uh, it's, a, it's actually kind of oh yeah sorry it's kind of the generalization of an array so you know you guys have been using numpy arrays right which is just I mean what's an array it's just a bunch of numbers in a line right so you can what's what's the, a line is one dimensional and what's next is two dimensional right so it's a grid so a grid of numbers is called a matrix and then the generalization of that is a tensor, basically. And so you can have three dimensions or four dimensions or ob you know, objects that have n dimensions of numbers. And so 
That's what this is, and that's what this is. A tensor. Tensor. T-E-N-S-O-R. And so what this... Yes, that's a... That, because it uses tensors inside of it for doing neural networks. Yeah. So what, um, what this Einstein equation does is that it relates this tensor which describes how space-time is curved as a, you know, as proportional to the mass content of space-time. And so the general theory of relativity says that gravity is actually caused by space itself being curved. And it's curved by there being mass in the space. So that's what this, this video is sort of demonstrating. These, these balls are masses, and when they're in the space, they cause the space-time to kind of like curve and bend and, and um, suck in around the mass. And then, that, and then the, the objects in space kind of follow the space-time, which is curved. Okay, so one interesting thing about the general theory of relativity is that it made this very interesting prediction, which is that gravity should have waves. There should be waves of gravity. And so what this, um, this funny tube is representing is a gravitational wave passing. So it's like a, the wave is, is traveling along the axis of this tube. And these lines, these, these um, uh, you know, ridges on the tube are showing the, how space-time is stretching and compressing as the wave passes. So this is the very particular motion that a gravitational wave produces, is that when it moves through space, it causes the space around it in one direction to shrink, and then, then the other direction to expand, and then it oscillates like that as the wave moves through space. Okay, so this theory, so Einstein predicted these waves. I mean, so what Einstein did was he, he this is a, one of the cool things about how physics works, is that he made that equation, right? He made that mathematical equation to describe how space curves and bends when you have mass in it. Then when you start to work out the equation, you start to put in different numbers, you know, make up different scenarios, he saw that the way that equation predicted these waves. So he, Einstein knew right after he made this, even before he realized, I mean, you know, he wasn't thinking about the waves at first, but when he made the theory, all of a sudden he was like, oh, wow, this theory actually predicts there should be waves of gravity. But he didn't think that they would ever be seen because he put in some numbers and it turned out these waves were really, really small. And so, but a... a you know, many years later, this was in the 70s until the 90s, these guys discovered this, this funny star system. We were looking out in space and we saw what was, a, what was a light, basically a light flashing, and it was flashing at a really, really hyper-precise rate, okay? And then they, they started to predict, well, what would make this star do this? And it turns out that it's what's called a, um, a pulsar. So it's a kind of a star that's really super dense, and for reasons that are too complicated to get into, it's shooting these jets of, of radio waves out on either side. And then the, since the light is spinning, the, the, the star is spinning around, it's basically like a lighthouse. It's basically exactly like a lighthouse. It's sweeping, these beams are sweeping through space, right? And so what happened is, what's happening is we're standing on Earth and this lighthouse star is spinning around, sweeping these radio waves. And so every time one of those radio waves passes by us, we see this flash. It's really exactly like a lighthouse, right? You can, you can count, you know, if you look at a lighthouse far away, you just see flashes of light that are at a very regular interval as the beam passes in front of you. And so that's what these guys were doing. And so they started to keep very precise measurement on when these flashes were coming. But then they noticed something really interesting, which is that the flashes weren't coming at an exactly regular interval. The interval was, was modulating. So it would, it would come, the, the gap between the flashes would be a little bit shorter in one second and then a little bit longer and then a little bit shorter and a little bit longer. 
And so what they realized is that the reason that was happening was because the pulsar was orbiting around another star. So there were two stars orbiting around each other, and one of them was the pulsar. And so that orbit was causing that flash from the beam to be modulated. It would come at slightly different times. And so then they started tracking that over many, many years, starting in 1975. And what they showed was that the orbital, the, the orbital period of these two stars was actually getting less and less and less and less. So they were orbiting around each other faster, and they were getting closer together. And they can tell this just by looking at the time interval of the flashes. It's really cool. And so what they realized was that the reason that was happening was because these two stars were emitting gravitational waves. And the waves, waves are a form of energy, and so that energy, the waves that were being emitted were taking energy away from the system, were like putting energy out far away, and then that was causing the energy of the star system, you know, they're orbiting around each other, and as they lose energy, they get closer and closer together. And so they, they, they tracked this over time, and it perfectly matched with Einstein's prediction about gravitational waves. And so this was a totally beautiful, this is like one of the most beautiful physics things, in my opinion, and they won a Nobel Prize for it. It was really great, because they, not only did they discover these pulsars with these beams and these neutron stars orbiting around each other, but it's also emitting gravitational waves, and it perfectly matches Einstein's general theory of relativity. Really, really awesome stuff. All right, but that was, so that was in the 90s, and that was sort of indirect proof that these gravitational waves exist. Because we don't actually see the waves from that system. We just see the effect that it has on the orbit. So then, then in the 60s, this was, before, this was before that result, this guy tried to actually measure the waves directly. He tried to make a device that would actually, you know, respond when the wave hit it. And so that's what this thing is. So this is called a resonant mass detector, or a bar detector. And it's just a giant chunk of metal, and with the, all of these sensors wrapped around it. And so what he's trying to do is that, when a gra what, what he thinks is going to happen is that when a gravitational wave hits that bar, it will ring like a bell, right? Like, just like you flicked a bell. And it'll ring, and then all of these sensors, but it'll be a really tiny, faint ring, and then these sensors will pick up that ringing, and he'll be able to measure it. And it was a very cool idea, um, but he never detected anything. And unfortunately, he claimed he detected something, but then nobody else could detect anything using the same kind of device. So that was a little bit unfortunate. Um, but so he, he had some... Uh, credibility problems later in his career. But for those of us who work in, the, in this field, we kind of consider him the, the, basically the grandfather of the field because he was the first one to really look for these waves even when nobody else thought it was possible or even believed that these waves existed. All right, then later on came these guys. These guys were all at Caltech here. This, this guy is, is actually still around. He's got an office up on the third floor, although he's retired now. And uh, this guy, unfortunately, passed away um, last year. And, and this guy's still around, too. And this was, this was actually my professor at MIT. He, he's, he's a really, really cool guy. And so these guys had the idea. They, they picked up on this, and they were like, how can we improve on this experiment? How can we do it better? And so they came up with a new, totally new idea about how to detect gravitational waves. I, I want to... Put down the shade. Do you know how to put these shades down? Light and shades. Sun shades. This one, do you think? No, that's the lights. Window shades. Blackouts. Oh, front. front. Okay. That's good. Oh, so we can do just half. Okay. 
All right, so remember that, remember that wave, that tube, that was the gravitational wave moving, right? It, it, had, it was shrinking on one direction and expanding on the other, and then vice versa. So this is one of those, those rings on that tube, and it's doing, that, it's doing that motion, right? So in this case, the wave is coming out of the screen towards you, and it's causing the, that tube to bend like that. So what this makes is what we call, a diff, it's called a differential strain. So it's a, it's a delta L, a change in length, divided by the length, which is detail you don't, is not so important. But let's, let's, well, it is important, but we'll come back to it. So, okay, let me take a second to explain this. So have you guys studied waves at all? Wave, a little bit. You Sometimes you get to them in maybe your first, physics class, and m maybe more so in college do you start to study them more. I, I asked about it recently, just this research project. Yeah. Waves are, waves are really, like, this, these, 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 these kinds of waves are all over physics. It's really kind of underlying everything. But they have this funny property, which is that, you see these, see these two waves here, See how they both go up and down at exactly the same time, right? And these two waves over here, one goes up and the other one goes down. So these two waves are called, they're in phase. That means that the, the troughs and the peaks line up with each other. And these two waves are exactly out of phase because the peak lines up with the trough in the other one. And so when you add these two waves together, two waves that are in phase, then you get a bigger wave. If you add two waves that are out of phase, exactly out of phase, you get nothing. Okay? So this is a property of any wave, including things like light, most, sort of most importantly for this story. Light behaves this way. So you can do this, you can do this kind of thing with lasers. You can make two lasers that are exactly the same frequency, you can line up their peaks and troughs, and they will double the power, the amplitude of the wave. Or you can put them exactly out of phase, and the, the light will go away. So what they did was they looked at this device, which is called a Michelson interferometer. So let me, oops, let me see if I can pause this. Maybe I can't pause it. Um, so the way that the Michelson interferometer works is that you have a laser beam and you shoot it and it hits a mirror. See, here's the wave. And it exactly splits the wave in two. And one of, the, one of those split waves goes down one arm and hits a mirror. The other goes down the other arm and hits a mirror. Then they come back together and they combine at the, back at the beam splitter. And then look what happens. These two waves are exactly out of phase with each other, right? So there's no light. However, if the end mirrors move a little bit, right, then all of a sudden the waves can become in phase and the light gets bright. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see how that relates to that picture I just showed? This is called a Michelson interferometer. This was invented, this, doing this, using light to do this kind of thing, was invented in the, uh, like 18, in the late 1800s by a guy named Michelson. And he was using it, well, I won't get into that, but he was using it for kind of a similar kind of measurement as I'm going to describe. But the point is, is that with this device, what is, what's the trick about this device? The trick is that when these end mirrors move, you get light, you, you get a change in the light here, right? So what happens is that this device is really, really good at measuring the relative length of these two arms, right? So you have these two mirrors at the end, and if one of the mirrors moves a tiny bit, then you get some light coming out. So what this device can do is really hyper-precisely measure how far these two mirrors are from this beam splitter. Okay, now, what does that matter? Look at this. Let's just put this device in the middle of the tube. What? 
That was weird. Doesn't like that animation for some reason. So you see what's going on here? So this, this, this thing in the middle is just that Michelson interferometer from the previous animation, just put on its side so you're looking at it straight from above. And this is the, the ring from the tube. And what's happening? The ring is moving because the gravitational wave is passing through. It's making the end mirrors move because the gravitational wave is causing space-time to bend, which is causing masses to move with the space-time. So the masses are moving with the ring. When they move, they cause the arms of the Michelson interferometer to shrink and expand, which causes light to come out. So in principle, we can use a Michelson interferometer to directly measure a gravitational wave passing by. So this was like, this was the massive, this was the big insight that these guys had. And so they both tried to make experiments to do this. They tried to make Michelson interferometers whose job it was, was to detect gravitational waves. And th that guy, Rainer Weiss, did it at MIT, and these other guys did it here at Caltech. And then they went to the NSF, and they said, give us money so that we can make a really big one, because the ones we're making are not sensitive enough. Man, my, what is happening here? Not liking that animation. So this was the one, this was what they were building at MIT, and this is what they were, this is the one they built at Caltech. And this one, this one still exists. This is where, this is where I was first working when I came to Caltech. You can go on the other side of campus and see this. If you guys are interested, actually, I'd be happy to give you a tour. We can talk to uh, Christine about that. Um, so these are pretty small. These fit in a room. But these aren't big enough to really detect gravitational waves, because as we'll see later, gravitational waves are really weak. They're really small. They, the, the amount of that they move things is, will, is really, really small. It'll blow your minds. And these things are not big enough to detect them. So. What they did is they got money to make this simple Michelson much more complicated. And so after basically decades of research, they figured out how to make the interferometer much more sensitive. And I won't go into all of the things, but basically you can see that the laser beam is bouncing around more. There's more mirrors. They, they figured out ways to basically amplify the signals. And this was a whole progression of research over the years until they made these giant interferometers. Giant. So this is, this, the, this arm length here is two and a half miles long. There are, two, there are two of them. This one's in Washington State, up in eastern Washington, and this one's in Louisiana. I mean, look at that. That's two and a half miles long. This is, you can see these from space. And this, so this is a big building here in the middle, and in the middle here is where the laser is, where the beam splitter is, and where the detector of the light is, the thing that detects the light when there's a tiny change of the length of the arms. So what, is, what are these devices doing? They're doing just what I described. They're measuring the relative length of these two arms. Yeah? What about things like earthquakes? That's a very good question, and I will show you in just a second. Okay, so, yeah, this is, these are from the NSF. One is in eastern Washington State. Here we are down here at Caltech. There's MIT over there. And then this is the other one that's in uh, Louisiana. And they're three, almost exactly 3,000 miles separated from each other, which is, which is equal to a light travel time of 10 milliseconds. So it would take a beam of light 10 milliseconds to get between each. Which is, which is relevant, I'll explain in a minute. So oh. <laughs> this, is, this is inside that building in the middle of the L, that big building where the two arms connect. This is what's inside of it. So over here is the laser. And the laser comes in here, 
and bounces around. And then in this chamber right here is the beam splitter. And one of the light beams goes out over here through this arm, which pokes a hole in the side of the building and keeps going for two and a half miles. And then the other one goes here and goes all the way down here. And then the, they, the light bounces off the mirrors at the ends, comes back, bounces through the beam splitter again, and then that, the little bit of light that leaks out goes down this way. And then there's a, another chamber down here where we have the detector that detects the light. Okay, so what's inside of these chambers? Oh, by the way, here's a person. So you can see how big it is in there, right? These things are, these things are something like, 20 feet tall, and this, you know, these are some steps to get, that you can walk over to get to the inside over here. These are all clean rooms. That, that person is wearing um, a clean room suit. It's sort of like a hazmat suit, but for the inverse, because we're not, we're not worried about any of the stuff in here hurting humans. What we're worried about is the humans infecting the experiment. Because it's such a precision experiment, we have to keep all of the human dirt and sweat and stuff out of it. So we have to wear special clothes, clothes to contain our dirt when we go inside this room. Okay, so what's in these chambers is the solution to the problem that you mentioned, which is that this interferometer is built on the ground. And it needs to be very, very sensitive, because like I said, the gravitational waves are really, really weak. So we're looking for just a tiny motion of the mirrors. And so in order to protect the mirrors from the ground, you know, the interferometer sits on the ground, so, and the ground moves a lot. You don't really feel that the ground is moving that much, but it actually moves quite a bit. It's always shaking, right? There are cars driving by on the road. They cause the ground to shake. There's earthquakes all over the place. Um, there's uh, the t the, what, an interesting noise is that all of the waves crashing on the ocean shore, that actually causes the ground to move quite a bit, even in the inside of the country. I mean, we're close to the shore here, but even if you go into the middle of the country, there's, the ground is still moving because of all the waves crashing on the shore. And so this, what this is, it's kind of hard to see here because this is like a CAD, a, 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 a computer drawing that's kind of split in half. But this, this down here is the mirror, okay? And this is supposed to be the laser beam. And this mirror is hanging from another mirror, another mass, which is hanging from another mass, which is hanging from another mass, which is hanging from another mass. And then this is a big table. This is a big, like, seismic you know, um, table that can move around. And then the, it's sitting on top of these pillars, this, these tubes which are on top of these pillars which sit on the ground. So the whole point of all of this is to make this mirror insensitive to what happens on the ground. So what this whole system, what it does, is that when the ground moves, this mirror doesn't move. It moves just a tiny, tiny bit. This, all of this stuff is to keep the mirror from moving when the ground moves. And here's an example of the actual thing being put together at uh, one of the sites. So it's a big metal, this, is a, this big metal table is this part up here. And this is, the, this is a, another drawing of what the mirrors look like. So you can see that there's this big chunk of glass. It's not like a mirror in your house. It's a big, big, thick chunk of glass that's like this big. And it's got these tiny little fibers that hold it up. And this is what it looks like installed. So up here, at the top, that's this thing, right? That's up here. Then this whole thing down here that's, that's this, which hangs from the bottom of that down here. So we're kind of looking up at it. And this is the main mirror. And, yeah, okay, I'll show some more pictures of that in a minute. This is the laser. So this is inside this special clean... This is an extra, extra, extra clean room where the laser is. 
because the laser is really, really powerful, and any dirt that gets inside the path of the laser will will eva- will like explode, not explode, but will you know basically disintegrate and cause there to be this dirty gas. And we can't if if the if dirt gets on any of these mirrors and it gets hit by the laser, it'll burn the mirror and it'll ruin the mirror because we use such a large amount of laser power. This is inside one of the chambers. This is where the detector is, where we measure the little bit of light. So I think that the laser beam would actually come in from this direction, and it would bounce around in some of these mirrors, and then it would get detected by the detector, which sits on this thing right here. This is like another cage with another thing hanging down from it. It's, again, it's all to um, reduce the seismic vibrations. And this is a, I really like this picture a lot because you can see a lot of stuff. So this, here's the mirror there, right, with the cage that goes up hanging from that big thing at the top. People, obviously. See, in these, like, hazmat-looking suits, but it's not to protect them. This has, these suits are not for the safety of the people. They're for the... Therefore, the instrument. Therefore, to keep this all super, super clean in here. Oh, I, I guess I should have mentioned that this, all of this metal tubing is a vacuum system. So once we have the whole interferometer put together, it's all inside of this vacuum system, and we suck out all the air. Because the air, just the air moving around, would push on this mirror and make the mirror move more than the gravitational wave would. So we have to get rid of all the air so that the only thing that's going to move the mirror is the gravitational wave. And so this is the arm down here. So this is the big tunnel that goes to the two and a half miles in the other direction down there. And this thing here is kind of interesting. So this is a mirror. It looks like it's transparent. It looks like you can see through it. But actually, it's, it's reflective at the frequency, at the wavelength of the light of the laser light, and the laser light is actually invisible. So you can't see it with your eyes. You need special detectors to be able to see it. And it's really powerful. It's kind of funny, right? It's this really powerful light that's invisible. And if you actually were to put your hand in front of it, you couldn't see it, and if you were to put your hand in front of it, it would burn your hand. It's so powerful. So we have to wear it. That's why these guys are wearing these special goggles, because you don't want... You can't see where the light is, but it could still like bounce around and go into your eye and burn your eye. There's no light, there's, no, none, of, there's none of the actual laser light going in right now. That only, we only turn on the laser light to go into the interferometer when the vacuum system's all closed up and there are no people inside. But these guys are in here because they're trying to fix something. But the point is, is that a little tiny bit of light leaks through this mirror and comes in bounces up here. And, and is detected. And this, this spot right here, that's actually, that's actually a different laser beam that's green that you can see. And they're using that to help guide the alignment of this system. Okay, so what is LIGO? LIGO is essentially, it's, it's like a microphone for space time. It's a microphone for space itself. The gravitational, gravity causes space to curve, The gravitational waves are waves of curved gravity, of curved space, and LIGO is just a microphone that's picking up these, 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 this motion, these waves. So, this, I wonder, who knows? Maybe we'll hear in a second. Um, This is, This is a kind of a complicated graph. So, I, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't expect you guys to understand this, but have you ever, um, have you guys ever looked at sound files on your computer? Have you ever, okay, how about um, you have like a stereo system and it has, you know, these bars that go up and down with the music? What those bars are representing is different frequencies, okay? And frequencies are like low frequency and high frequency. Like, it's the different pitch of the sound, right? 
So low frequency means that the, that the wave is, is longer wave, and high frequency means that it's, it's, a, it's a shorter, faster wave. And so what this plot is, is it's kind of like a really high resolution version of, that, of those bars that move up and down with the music. And so what's on this axis here is frequency. And so this is low frequency down here, and this is high frequency up here. And, the, and this axis is amplitude. And so what this is actually showing is how much the mirrors are moving, the two in mirrors, how much they're moving relative to each other, because remember, that's what the Michelson interferometer is measuring. The Michelson interferometer is measuring how much this mirror is moving relative to this one in this, in this way. One gets closer and the other gets farther away because that's what the gravitational wave's doing. So this, this plot is measuring how much motion you have, like this, in the interferometer as a function of frequency. So, I won't, I won't, try, I won't go into this too much, but if you guys have questions, we can, we can talk about it later. The point is that at the very lowest point, where we have, where the motion is the smallest, the interferometer can measure three, so what this, this means is three, three E is, E is shorthand, it's, it's scientific notation. Have you, do you guys know what scientific notation is? Right? Well, what? Exponent. Exponent. So e, e basically means times 10 to the power of something else. Right? And it's to the power of minus 20. What, is a, what does a minus in the exponent mean? Well, it generally means that it happens to be divided instead of uh, multiplied. Because right. It's basically a line of, it's multiplying over and over and over again. That's a lot. Right. It doesn't make sense that right. <laughs> yeah. So the minus is the inverse. So it's one over this. So this is three, so what's three E three meters? What does three E three mean in more, in more natural language? Almost, not quite. Three E three. Exactly, and what's 10 to the power of three equal? A, a, a good shorthand to think about it is the number of the number in the exponent is the number of zeros. So it's a three, three e three is three times ten to the three, which is three with three zeros behind it. So what's that? Three thousand. So what's three e six? Not quite. What's six zeros? Three million, right? So three e six meters is three million meters. What is three e minus six? Right, it'd be one over three million. One divided by three million. What is so one so one e minus three is a millimeter, right? That's, that's, 1 e minus 3 is a millimeter, 1 e minus 6 is a micron, so you can see a millimeter, right? A millimeter is, is the smallest tick on a, on a meter stick. A micron is you take a millimeter and you divide it up a thousand times, so it's really small. A micron is like the size of your hair. What about a micrometer? That's a micrometer. A, micro, a micron is the, and, is, and a micrometer are the same thing. No, a micron, a micron and a micrometer are both 1 e minus 6. Then there's, well, there's 1 e minus 9, which is a nanometer. And a nanometer is a hair divided a thousand times. So it's that even smaller. Right. 
How, do you guys know how big the size of an atom is? Smaller than that. A, an atom is actually 1 e minus 10. It's less than a nanometer. It's, one, it's 10 times smaller than a nanometer is the size of an atom, like a hydrogen atom. It's close. It's, but it's, yeah. So an atom is 1 e minus 10. How about the nucleus of an atom? You know, atom, an atom is a nucleus, which is like protons and neutrons with electrons orbiting around it, right? So that's the whole, the whole thing, the whole atom is the nucleus, the electrons and the, the neutrons and the protons in the middle with the electrons zooming around. And that's 1 e minus 10. The nucleus is 1 e minus 15. So 1 e minus 15 is the nucleus of an atom. What is this number? This is 1 e minus 20. That's five time, 10 to the 5 times smaller than the nucleus of an atom. That's what this interferometer that I just showed you is measuring. It's measuring distance length changes of the two arms 10 to the what is 10 to the 6 was a million 10 to the 5 is 10,000 so 1 e minus 20 is 10,000 times smaller than the nucleus of an atom if that doesn't make your head explode then nothing will ever make your head explode that's this is like I've been working on this project for my, basically my entire adult life. And every time I think about this, it blows my mind. It is, it, it is incredible. This is the most precise measurement device that humans have basically have ever made. Wow. This is an atom. Okay? 10 to the minus 10. This is the nucleus. We're zooming in. That little blue dot, that's 10 to the minus 15 up to the edge of the nucleus. That's what we're measuring. This tiny, tiny, tiny shift. Okay. So, I won't go into, I, I won't go into the details of this pl plot, but this plot is really kind of our most important plot because it tells us how good we're doing. It tells us how, you know, we want this black curve here to be as, as small as possible. Because the, the lower this curve is, that means the more sensitive we are to gravitational waves. Okay. What does it sound like? Oh, wait, I didn't have to plug in the sound. <laughs> Okay, what I said was LIGO is a microphone, and I'm, I'm kind of not kidding. LIGO is almost like, it's, it's a microphone for space-time. These, these frequencies here, this is, this is where LIGO is most sensitive. These frequencies, do you, do you guys know what the frequencies are that we hear? It doesn't matter. These frequencies are the frequencies that we hear. It's with our ears. That's, this is totally coincidental. This is not like on purpose that we did this. It just so happens that when we build one of these detectors on the Earth, the frequencies that it's most sensitive to are the same frequencies that we can hear with our ears. So what we're listening to, this is basically the, what the, thi the thing that LIGO is measuring recorded by that little photodetector where the light, the light is moving around on the photodetector. 
we, we, that, that electrical signal goes into a computer, which is recorded, and that's what we're listening to. That's it. That's like we're listening to the signal directly coming out of the instrument. And then you hear all that high pitch stuff? The that's all of these sharp lines. And it's, and it's interesting that most of that sound comes from... I showed you that the, there was the, the masses where the laser beam bounces off of, right? Was held up by these thin little wires. Well, those thin little wires are like the string on a violin. And they vibrate like violin strings. And so those vibrations actually cause the mass to move around a little bit at the same frequency that the, that, the, the, that the fiber is vibrating. So what we're hearing is actually the sound of the, of the interferometer basically just vibrating on its own. That's what that sound is. That's, this is the sound, this is the sound, so imagine that you have a microphone that's really sensitive right? And you put it in an empty room and you record. It's going to sound like nothing, right? But what you might want to do is turn up the volume really, really loud because the, there's, no, there's no sound in the room. And so you, you put the microphone down and you, turn up, you keep turning up the volume. And eventually, what are you going to hear? You're going to hear like a hiss. Right? Have you ever turned up, you ever hear a, that hiss from a microphone that's like turned up really loud? You hear that shh. That sound is basically the sound of the microphone. Because, because there's, there's, there's noise inside the microphone. You usually don't hear it because when you're recording, like when this thing is recording my voice, my voice is obviously really loud. I don't really need this microphone, but we need it for the for the recording. So my voice is way louder than the hiss that's inside the microphone. But if we, if we were to all sit very quietly and turn up the volume, you would start to hear the hiss that's coming from inside the microphone. It's also coming from inside of, of this thing that's amplifying the microphone. And so what we're hearing when we listen to this is the sound of the, the vibrations from the inside of the, the interferometer and then also some hiss from like the electronics and stuff like that. So, but, but we can filter that out because we can hear that, that high pitch stuff, we can filter it out. And then what we're left with is this. That's the real, that's, the, that's when we take away all of those, those high pitched vibrations and we filter out That's what we're left with. That's basically the interferometer just listening to space. But that all, all, everything we hear there, that's not gravitational waves. That's the sound from the detector itself. It's the same thing when you turn up the microphone really loud. However, listen really carefully. Did you hear that little pop? right there. All right. I just talked about the technology of the interferometer itself, right? But what are we trying to what are we trying to detect? We're trying to detect gravitational waves. Where do gravitational waves come from? Well, I showed one example earlier which was those those two stars that were orbiting around each other, right? where one of them was a pulsar, those things are emitting gravitational waves. What else emits gravitational waves? These are, this is a simulation, this is a computer simulation of two black holes that are orbiting around each other. And they're, they're, they're orbiting around each other in front of a field of stars in the background. And all of this crazy stuff you're seeing here is the space-time around the black holes being warped by the fact that the black holes are there. Remember, the black holes are mass. Einstein's general theory of relativity says 
the mass is going to cause space-time to curve. And so what's happening here is that all the space-time is curving as the black holes move around each other. And it's curving in this crazy way, and it's causing all the light behind it to get bent and warped. But these black holes are orbiting around each other. They're getting faster and faster. And then, at the very end, they all of a sudden get really close, and then, boom, they, they like suck together, and then they become one big black hole. Here's another, here's another computer simulation where you have two, two black holes. One's a little bit bigger than the other one. And these, this swirly pattern, that's the waves of gravity that are moving away from it as they get closer together. And it, the, the pattern is changing as the waves are getting bigger and bigger. Right? The waves are getting bigger, faster, faster as the two black holes, bam! And then right at the end, when the two black holes finally merge together, there's this big burst of gravitational waves. Let's look at that one more, one more time, because this one's really cool. So it's, so you can see, it's like at, at the beginning, the late waves are low, and then they start to get bigger and bigger. It's cut out in the middle because it's too hard to do the calculation there. But it, they're getting bigger, 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 and then right at the end, when they are spinning around really fast, then bam, there's this big burst of waves. Yeah? That's the pop. That's exactly what it is. So the, so the first sound you hear, that's the sound I played earlier, right? That's the, that's the sound of the noise of the detector, and then there's the pop. And that pop is a gravitational wave. And then the next sound you hear is the sound sped up. No, I'm sorry, not sped up, slowed down, so that, it's, so that it's easier to hear for humans. So there's the pop. Yeah, because when it's full speed, it, it goes really fast. It's just a boop. You don't hear the structure. But when you slow it down, all of a sudden you hear this whoop, whoop, right? That's that. Look, like, look at what the, what's happening to the waves, right? They're low, and then all of a sudden they get closer together and, and louder. And that makes a chirp. A whoop. And that's the gravitational wave signal. So that sound that you heard was the first ever detection of gravitational wave. It was made by LIGO just um, less than two years ago. And it was a really big deal. It was really, really, it was the biggest science news story of the year. And it, uh, and maybe of the decade. It was really, really big deal. And this was, this was the physics journal that we published this result in. And so, so what, this is, this is a little example of, this isn't exactly how we do the data analysis, but this signal, what you're seeing here, is this is just the waveform that this is just the data that that LIGO did, you know records, and so what you can see is that first it looks like kind of noisy, and then you start to see something, and then it's this whoop. This is the chirp, and this down and this is the two detectors. This one is the Hanford, the Washington detector, and this is the the Louisiana detector, and so this is what we recorded, having been filtered, so you don't hear the high pitch stuff. And then this plot here is our computer prediction of what we think two black holes would make a signal to look like. And then we take this data and we subtract this 
numerical waveform, and then we just get noise. And this is demonstrating that, that this signal comes from this prediction about two black holes. This is important because this is what you're going to do in the Chapter 3 capstone. This, this analysis right here is basically what you do in the chapter three. It's one of the things that you do in the chapter three capstone. And this is another, this, this is called a spectrogram. This is the time, and this is time on this axis and frequency on this axis, and you can see the chirp. So this is, this is again another simulation of this is of a different event, though. So the ones, that, the ones that I showed before, those are simulations of the first gravitational wave we detected. And then, a couple months later, we detected another one. And it was slightly different because the main mass was a little bit bigger and the other, one, the other mass is smaller. But you can see, right, they orbit around each other and the, 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 the signal is getting bigger and closer together and then they merge together at the very end and it makes a big burst of waves. This, I won't go into, this is a little bit complicated, but this is the, this is the real plot. That this is what we use, this is what we show to the other physicists to say, look, we're really sure we detected something. And um, I can explain it to you guys if you're curious later, but um, this, is the, this is kind of the real, real thing that we, we show to the other physicists as, as our proof. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff we can, we can figure out from this gravitational wave signal. So one is that we can figure, we know, we can tell how far away it came from. By, by knowing the amplitude of the signal. And this collision came from 1.3 billion light years away, which is really far away. It's actually one-tenth the, of the distance to the edge of the universe. So it's really far away the signal came from. These two black holes, the, one of them was originally 36 times the mass of the sun. This is this, this M with this circle and dot next to it, it's called a solar mass, that means the mass of the sun. So one of the black holes was 36 times the mass of the sun, the other was 29 times the black mass of the sun. But the, the black hole at the end was 62 times the mass of the sun. And if you do the math, you'll see that 36 plus 29 is equal to 65, but the mass at the end was 62. So what happened? was that the gravitational waves themselves had energy that was three times the mass of the sun. So the, I, I guess I should mention that I'm talking about energy in terms of mass, because this, this was another thing that Einstein said, was that E equals mc squared, right? Energy and mass can be converted back and forth. So the mass from these black holes got converted into waves, waves of gravitational energy, gravitational wave energy. And then this one is interesting, and basically these two black holes, when they collided, you can't see the gravitational waves, you can only hear them with the gravitational wave detectors like LIGO, but the amount of energy that was released by these black holes colliding was the brightest thing in the universe for a short period of time. It was the loudest thing in the whole universe. So this is a, just a plot of, the, of all of the black holes that we now know about. So these are, these are black holes that we already knew about by looking at X-rays. The astronomers can can sometimes tell that there's a black hole somewhere because the things falling into the black hole emit X-rays. So if they see these special kind of X-rays, 
then they can tell that there's a black hole there. And then these are the black holes we detected with LIGO. So what's interesting, these black holes we detect with LIGO are quite a bit bigger than these ones that we've seen with X-rays. So that's kind of interesting. We can tell a little bit about where these black holes were in the sky, but not too much, because LIGO, LIGO is a microphone, but it's not a good directional microphone, right? So if you just have one ear, it's kind of hard to hear where a sound is coming from. If you have two ears, you can tell a little bit better. So we have two detectors, so we can tell a little bit where the sound is coming from, but we can't pinpoint it. And so these are the blobs on the sky about where we think the gravitational wave came from. So this is the first one we detected here. And so we can say, basically, it's coming from somewhere over there. It's not coming from over there. It's coming from somewhere over there. But why do we care where the gravitational waves came from? Where in the sky? Because this is what a black hole merger looks like to your eyes. It's supposed to be a joke. Because they're black holes, they don't emit any light, there's nothing to see. However, there are some things that emit gravitational waves that we can see. Oh, man. What is going on? Didn't used to do this. Doesn't like some of my animations all of a sudden. This may be, maybe it'll crash again. But if you have two neutron stars, like those things that I showed earlier with the pulsars, if you have two of those orbiting around each other and they collide, they make a huge burst of light. Really, really bright. And they, they make what are called gamma ray bursts. And sometimes stars explode. You guys have heard of supernovas? A supernova is when a star explodes. And when a star explodes, that also makes a huge burst of light. These are not actual videos, by the way. These are computer simulations. And so these big bursts of light, the, the, when a star explodes, it can also make gravitational waves. And so what we want to be able to do, we want to be able to hear the gravitational waves and then say, oh, you know what? We think that those gravitational waves came from over there. And then point telescopes to look at where we think the gravitational wave comes, for, came from to see if we can see a burst of light that might have come with it. So, but what do we need to be able to detect where it came from better? We need more detectors. We need more ears. Because the more ears we have, the better we can localize where it came from. So this is what we have right now. And if we add another detector that's, that's being made in Italy right now, then all of a sudden, all of these these regions can get much smaller. And that's much better because we can, it's much easier to scan this region with a telescope than it is to scan this one. This is really big. That's much better. So, right now there's people all over the world are trying to build these gravitational wave detectors. So we, what LIGO is, is these two in the US, and the only thing that's detected these gravitational waves so far is LIGO. The, that's, that's planned, that's not yet. This one is, there's one in Germany that's smaller. There's the one in Italy, which is under construction, but it's actually just come on, online, actually. And so they're going to start looking for the gravitational waves with us starting right now, like literally today. There's, they're building one in Japan which is inside of a mountain. They dug, they dug down into a mountain and put the interferometer inside of a mountain. And the reason to do that is that that reduces the ground motion because the, basically the mountain absorbs the, the, the seismic noise. So it's much quieter inside of a mountain, which is better. 
It's also expensive, and they have some technical problems, but they're going to be able to, it's a much quieter environment there. And then we have, interestingly, just made a, um, an agreement with India that we'll build another one of our LIGO detectors in India. But that hasn't started, um, that hasn't started yet. Hopefully that'll start soon. So, so far we've detected four gravitational wave events. But we want to detect a lot more, obviously. So we're going to keep trying to make the detectors better so we can detect more events. And hopefully, when we get up to the... when we make the detectors as good as we think we can make them, we should be able to detect multiple events every week. And that'll be really interesting. And hopefully we'll detect... An, oh, I should also mention that the only thing we've detected so far are black holes. Black holes colliding together, which is also kind of interesting. It's not really what we expected at first. So we, but we want to detect a lot of these other kinds of things. So we need to make the detectors better but we're working on that. And anyway, I'll leave this up for you guys to ponder. But that's it. Um, it's a little bit late, and, and we were gonna, I mean, we'll take a break soon and start the lab, but do you guys have, if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. Um, that that's a that is a very good question, actually. The you, in in principle, yes, but the the what we call that a gravitational wave background, right? A background like there's a bunch of things. If you have a lot of stuff that's orbiting around each other, emitting gravitational waves, then there should be this background noise of gravitational waves. However, we don't think that th there's not enough of that. That noise is, uh, basically the way I would say it is that that noise is not loud enough that we hear it with LIGO. Mm -hmm. That noise should exist, but it's not loud enough that we can hear it with LIGO. the sound that you heard is gravitational wave. So that is basically, um, that's basically the, pl the plot that I showed that I said was complicated. But what we do, I'll, give, I'll try to briefly describe. So we listen to all, we, we basically record all this data, and it's all noise. It basically all just sounds like that, that thing that I played you earlier. It's just noise. And so we're basically trying to listen for like a pin drop in this noise. So one thing that helps us is that we know what the sound should sound like. We, we know what the sound of a dropping of a pin sounds like. We, we have these computer simulations of two black holes doing that dance that I showed you, right? And we know what the signals look like. That's what that's what this is, right? This is like a computer drawing what the, way, what, the, what the sound will be. So since we know exactly what sound we're listening for, that makes it a little bit easier, okay? Then the other thing we do is we, 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 we take this data and we look for these exact sounds, right? We can do that by... It's actually in your capstone. It, that's what the capstone is doing, is, is doing this. It's basically taking one of those computer-generated waveforms and turning it into a filter, which you can then 
fly along the data. It's like it's like looking, you know, you're going along looking. Do you see? Does the data look like this? Exactly like this thing that we we think that the sound should look like. And you go through that and you look in all the data for all of the times that you have these signals. And then the other trick is that we have two detectors, right? So every now and then, the noise might just look like that signal a little bit. But since we have two detectors, and the gravitational wave is going to hit both of the detectors at roughly the same time, then we have to look for these two signals in the two data streams from the two detectors. They have to happen at the same time. So that's, that's another important thing that we have to we look for. We look for the same sound in both detectors at the same time. And if we, if we see that, then we know we, we're onto something. Yes, that's that, that, so. That's the but, so when I say that the detect when the that, when I say that the gravitational wave hits the detectors at the same time, it's not necessarily exactly the same time because you know if you've got one detector's here and one detector's here and the gravitational wave comes this way, it's going to hit one detector slightly before the other detector. Exactly. Right. So if the detectors are exactly on the same level when the wave comes, then they'll hit. At exactly the same time. If the wave is coming from up here it, and you know along the line of the detectors, then it's going to hit one detector first and then the other detector later. That time difference between the detectors is 10 milliseconds. Right? Remember what I showed earlier. Because the gravitational wave travels at the speed of light, so the time that it takes the gravitational wave to get from one detector to the other detector at the longest time it could take is 10 milliseconds. So we know that the, the uh, signals that we're looking for have to be in the two data streams within 10 milliseconds of each other. So that helps us constrain where, how we're looking for them. Uh, it's like a single mile. So. Well, it's 3,000 kilometers. It's a, long, it's a long way to go. But yeah, 10 so milliseconds. Yeah, so that's like a human difference. Well, you know, think about it. Light takes eight minutes to come from the sun. together as they flew by each other. 